Hi everyone, this is an introductory video on the photoelectric effect. Um, our names are Tim Hachigian and Ben Heron. Unfortunately, Tim is not feeling well, so I'll be your narrator today. Um, we're in the Department of Material Science and Engineering in the College of Engineering at Boise State University. Before we discuss the photoelectric effect itself, we kind of have to have a quick discussion about what we mean when we say a metal. So you've heard of lots of different metals, aluminum, iron, magnesium, gold, silver, any of those. We want to picture a metal that's made of one element rather than more than one element, like steel, which is um, iron and carbon and sometimes, you know, things like chromium and aluminum, things like that. So imagine a single element uh, metal, and this is kind of a bulk picture of that metal. The orange circles with the plus signs in the middle are positive ions, and the blue circles with minus signs in the middle are um, electrons. So what happens is, as these atoms come together to form a metal, each one contributes, each atom contributes one or two or three or four electrons, and uh, what, what these electrons create is what we call a sea of electrons. Sea of electrons. This sea of electrons is actually one of the biggest reasons why metals are typically such good conductors, especially at you know room temperature or something like that. Each one of these electrons can actually move through the metal with relative ease uh, because it's not bound to any one atom. And this results in kind of a lot of different nice properties, but one of the things we're interested in for this metal is actually what happens when we get near the surface. So the surface could be, you know, anywhere in this area or anywhere in this area. You can imagine it's kind of just anywhere around these things. In order for an electron to leave the surface of the metal, it has to overcome some kind of um, energetic requirements. And what I mean by that is that it has to overcome what we call the work function. So work function. And we usually denote this with a symbol that looks kind of like that. And the work function is the energy it takes to remove an electron from the surface of the metal. And that's going to be a really important thing as we move forward to discuss what we mean when we say the photoelectric effect and why that's significant. So here's a basic experimental setup for the photoelectric effect and kind of how we can measure it. We've got a light source over here on the left. And as we can see, there are lots of different uh, rays of light or waves of light or however you want to think about it. Um, we'll define that a little bit, a little bit more clearly later. On the right, we've got a current detector, and what this current detector does is it, um, as these electrons through here pass through this detector, through this interface, um, it'll measure a current. We can use the current measured in order to find out how many electrons have passed through there. And the reason that this kind of experimental setup works is because of what we call the photoemission process, which is the process of the photoelectric effect. And from all that we've talked about so far, all that we really know about this effect is that this light source shines light down onto the surface of the metal, which is kind of this area in here. And for some reason, that will cause electrons to be ejected from the surface of the metal. And if we use the definition that we have before, which says that an electron requires a certain amount of energy to be emitted from the surface of the metal, what this suggests is that the light is bringing some sort of energy to the surface that's energizing these electrons and they're being emitted. From a classical standpoint, so pre-quantum physical standpoint, it was thought that increasing the intensity of this light, uh, which is basically a measure of how many of these light uh, waves are going to be incident on the surface of this metal. By increasing the intensity of that light, we can generate a greater photoelectric current. Um, so to kind of summarize that, what the classical thought process was, was that I was proportional to intensity. So we'll call this I sub L. I sub electrons, so the electron current is proportional to the intensity of the light. So again, what that thought process really tells us is that with more intensity or with more light waves, we can generate a greater photocurrent, and with fewer light waves, we'll generate a smaller photocurrent. So where did this belief come from? Well, the way that 
uh, classical physics defined light before we discovered quantum physics was that light is a wave. That's a pretty important concept. The way we define intensity um, back then and the way we redefine it now is that intensity is a measure of the power transferred transferred to a surface area. or even just to a surface. And the units for this are watts per meter squared. And this is a pretty important thing. As we know, one watt equals one joule per second, right? So what we're saying is that intensity is a measure of the number of joules supplied to a meter square per second. And this definition of intensity is true. The issue comes in what we mentioned before, which is this concept that light is a wave and only a wave. And by that definition, the assumption was that as light interacts with the surface of this metal, the properties of the energy of this light are additive. So that means that if I have two beams of light and they're hitting the surface of this metal, or two waves of light, we might get something like two electrons emitted. And if we have a third light wave, we might get a third electron, and a fourth light wave, we might get a fourth electron, and so on and so forth, until what we're really talking about is we can shine pretty much an infinite amount of light onto the surface of this metal and extract, kind of like what we're getting at, an infinite amount of electrons. But it turned out that experimentally, this was not the case. It wasn't the case that by increasing intensity, we could increase photoelectric current. So what that motivated was it motivated us to scrap this theory. It doesn't motivate us to scrap the definition of intensity, but it motivates us to scrap the idea that increasing the intensity will increase the photoemitted current. What scientists instead found was that Rather than by bombarding the surface of a metal with waves of all kinds of different energies and assuming that these would add up and create a large photocurrent, what was instead going on was that by changing the energy of a the light, they were, they were shining incident upon the surface of this metal. By changing the energy of that light, rather than the intensity, they were able to change the photocurrent, which led to a different model of thinking about this phenomenon. And this new model that was uh, kind of developed was a quantum mechanical model, as you can see, quantum mechanical. Um, the same experimental setup exists, so we have a light source here and a current detector. We've got light waves, or, or light waves or particles, incident on the surface of the metal, and then electrons are photoemitted and measured as a, as a current through this current detector. And as we just saw, the electric current is not proportional to the intensity of the light. We know that's not true experimentally. But we found that the electric current is proportional to the energy of the light. And as we're about to find out, that means that the electric current is proportional to the frequency of that light. That's F. So what that means is that it's not by shining more of these waves of light onto the surface of the metal that we get a greater photo photocurrent, but it's by changing the strength of that light that we can change the photocurrent. By strength, I mean the energy. And that led to one of the most important discoveries in physics in the 20th century, which is the wave-particle duality of light. And the reason that these experimental results motivated a new definition for light is because if light was the classically defined um, electromagnetic wave, then the only things that we can really change about it are its wavelength, which is lambda, or the intensity of the delivery of this beam. Since treating this experiment, or treating the theory of this experiment, wasn't really answerable by that classical definition, there had to be some other kind of answer. And that answer is that, um, is that light might be a collection of photons. 
Photon is a, is a term that basically means that light is a wave, and at the same time it's a particle. And another word that we like to use for this is that, or term, is that it's a series of wave packets. And if this is the case, then each one of these wave packets can have its own energy and some of its own properties. And that'll help us answer for some of these phenomena that we're seeing. Okay, so light is made of photons, which means that it's both waves and particles at the same time. And one of the big things about this definition of light as a collection of photons is that each photon, each photon has its own energy, own energy, or its own properties. And while we often engineer the generation of photons, like in the case of lasers or something like that, we often engineer these situations so that each photon has pretty much the same energy as all the photons around it, it's still the case that each photon has its own set of properties. And the property of interest here is the energy of that photon. And that's because each of these photons are what is going to be interacting with these electrons. Okay, so moving forward a little bit, let's ignore this area down here for a minute. What we're going to focus on for now is that energy is directly proportional to frequency. That's one of the most important things about defining some of the characteristics of these photons. What this, um, what this means is that if we have um, a photon with a certain wave form, kind of like this one here, where the peaks of this wave or the troughs of this wave are fairly far apart. What this tells us is that this is a low frequency wave. On the other hand, this here is a high frequency wave. Peaks and troughs aren't very far apart, they're pretty close together. And the frequency of this of these photons in on the left hand side here this is the low frequency on the right hand side this is the high frequency the frequency of these photons uh, gives us the energy of these photons or relates to the energy of these photons because as we said it's directly proportional to frequency so the spacing between the peaks of these or the troughs of these or really any point on these um, with repeated periodicity so like this point here and this point here are the same point. The space between these is the wavelength. So the energy of a photon, E, is going to be H, which is Planck's constant, and we'll go over that in a little bit, times C, which is the speed of light in a vacuum. Both of those things divided by this wavelength, which is in meters. Planck's constant is a, is a constant that has been discovered experimentally. Um, here are some numbers for that. The key thing is that uh, the units for that are joules times seconds, and uh, alternatively, electron volts times seconds. The speed of light in a vacuum, of course, is in meters per second, and it looks like some formatting didn't come through here. This is actually 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. 8 meters per second. And um, if we take these definitions as they're given to us, and we use something like C over lambda, what we're really saying is we're going to take these kind of taking a unit analysis of this, and we're going to say meters per second divided by meters. Something like that. And what that's going to leave us with is 1 over seconds, which is the same thing as inverse seconds. And that's actually what this piece looks like right here this frequency. Frequency is an in inverse seconds, which is the same thing as hertz. So, summarizing that, we've got that c over lambda is frequency, e is hc over lambda, so if we make a quick substitution, we see that e is equal to hf, which means that, again, energy is directly proportional to frequency. Okay, so now we have kind of this long, drawn-out definition of why energy is proportional to frequency, and why light is made of photons, all these different things, but what does this really mean for us in terms of using ideas of the photoelectric effect? Well, it turns out there are a lot of different uses for the ideas of photoelectric effect, and actually probably too many to mention here, 
But what we can do with what we've learned so far is we can kind of develop a calculation for this. So we've got a light photon, and that's incident on the surface of this metal. We're going to call this metal. And if this photon is of high enough energy, then we will see a photoelectron, which is just an electron that's been photoemitted. Photoemitted means that this photon has emitted it from the surface of the metal. And as you can probably guess, if this photon does not have high enough energy, then this photoelectron doesn't really exist, or it's still in the metal. It hasn't been emitted. So how do we find out the difference, really? Well, we can use an equation where we're going to set E. This is E of the electron. Energy of the electron is going to be equal to the energy of the photon, which is, as you remember, H times F. And we have to subtract the work function that we talked about earlier, this guy, work function. So what we're saying is that the energy of this emitted electron, the energy of this guy, is equal to the energy of this photon minus whatever energy, energetic requirement it took to remove the electron from this surface. Seems pretty simple. But before we go any further, we should probably set up some some boundary conditions for this or some conditions that we can use to say you know whether or not the electron is emitted or what kind of energy it has. So we know that if E E minus is less than well not less than or equal to but if it's less than zero then what we have is no emission. And we determine this E again by using this equation right here. So if it's less than zero, we have no emission. So that photon was not energetic enough to emit this electron. If E of the electron is equal to zero, what we're saying is that it's just barely emitted. Just emitted. What this means is that the electron doesn't really have any kinetic energy, so it might not go very far, but we don't really care about that. All we care about is that we've just overcome this energetic barrier work function here. And finally, if E, E minus is greater than zero, the energy of this thing is going to have some positive value, so it's going to move around, right? So it's emitted... and moving or providing a current. You should have been provided a worksheet to go along with this video, and it's probably safe to say that this slide here, or these concepts here, are some of the most important ones for solving the problems on that worksheet. Okay, so we've covered a lot of material here, so we should probably summarize this. Summary. What we covered is that there's this photoelectric experiment, right? And that's where we're going to shine light onto a metal, metal surface. And what we do from that is we're going to measure... current. The big thing about this is that our classical ideas classical ideas which I'm sure you remember were that intensity will provide more current. That idea is incorrect doesn't quite work out that way. Experimentally, what we see instead is this quantum mechanical idea. Quantum mechanical idea. And that quantum mechanical idea was that frequency, frequency or energy, which as we know are kind of the same thing when we think about it, 
we have a couple of constants, and the only difference is frequency, then frequency and energy are very closely related. Frequency or energy will lead to more current. The theory behind this and the conclusions um, experimentally agree with this, so this is better. This makes us happy. And we've also learned what, counts, what accounts for the differences between these ideas. Classically, what we have is that light is an electromagnetic EM, electromagnetic wave. And quantum mechanically, what we have is that light is a photon, or light can be described by photons, which are the same thing as both waves and particles. Now, the process that we go through in order to calculate some of the energies of photoemitted electrons or any of that other um, mathematics are important for lots of purposes, but what's really key is that you understand where this idea comes from and why it's important, and I think we've covered that pretty well. With that being said, though, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to ask your teacher, or if your classmates seem to have any better understanding of it, then feel free to ask them. Classmates are a really great resource that way. Or if you have any more questions, feel free to email me at Benjamin Heron, H-E-R-R-E-N, at Boise State. Dot edu. Um, happy to answer any questions that you have for this. If you're having trouble figuring out the concepts or um, computation, any of those things. Um, until then, though, good luck on your worksheet, and thanks for watching.